ஹசம் <coughs> We will now look at Ibn Hazm, the jurist, in today's lecture, inshallah. It will be a short one today and then we'll discuss it in more detail next week, Bezhnillahi Ta'ala. <clears throat> so now let's look at the intellectual environment or milieu during Ibn Hazm's time. There were many experts in diverse fields who left libraries filled with books. And our religion started with Iqra. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down a book. his last book but he also sent down other books in sahif so writing reading and books are very important in islam every muslim should try to have a library in his or her home and encourage their children to read as well i remember my father was not educated my mother was also not educated but my father could read a little bit and when i was probably about 5 years old or 6 years old <clears throat> he would take me to a little bookshop uh, in the street that we lived and we used to rent some books and i used i started reading the books of stories you can call it like the cartoon magazines that we have and that had an Im- tremendous impact upon me that i continued to borrow books and read from that library for more than 25 years and that's how i got into the habit of reading the books may allah bless my parents and all our parents too many scholars from the east migrated to spain to spread knowledge and to benefit from their vast collection of literary works william montgomery watt a very famous orientalist who has written a lot of books about islam <clears throat> has also written a book called a history of islamic spain not many of us actually know much about islam in spain and what kind of literary activity was going on in spain what kind of outstanding work on islamic sciences was done in spain so he mentions that in general then it can be said that up to the end of the 10th century the best developed field of study was the malikite doctrine of the branches or detailed legal prescriptions this is his description for the fiqh maliki fiqh so <clears throat> fiqh was the most widely studied subject or discipline of islamic sciences in spain at that time and this was to change somewhat there were also other fields of knowledge and we know that from about 950 of the current era there was some advanced study of medicine going on as well and al hakam who was one of the caliphs encouraged astronomy and mathematics these were the sciences of that time So apart from books on Malikite law important works in the field of history and biography were also produced one of the scholars gave a lecture at how at MIT i believe many many years ago and i happened to read a transcript of that uh, lecture and he mentioned something quite interesting i will not name him but he mentioned something very interesting he said that we read in our books that after the mongols had destroyed baghdad quote the muslims went from being scholars to selling beads in the markets of baghdad unquote this is what we usually see that the muslim decline happened rather abruptly when the mongols destroyed baghdad and destroyed the caliphate as well and it seems like the muslims went into a period of hibernation but then this scholar mentioned that we don't realize that the islam had already spread outside of the arab lands as well and some outstanding work in islamic sciences was still ongoing after, even after the fall of baghdad in north africa spain india iran and he lamented the fact that thousands of manuscripts handwritten manuscripts were lying covered with dust in the libraries of spain and north and north africa and even india and what's currently pakistan and iran and that muslim scholars muslim researchers do not go to those libraries to discover 
those manuscripts and read them. While on the other hand, Orientalists whom we criticize do go to such libraries. They come up with jewels and gems, hidden jewels and gems of Islamic work. And many of them have actually been published and translated into Western languages as well. al hakam built a magnificent library filled with books. And the historian said that the total number of books in his palace library was more than 400,000. Ibn Hazm heard from Talid al Husi, who was in charge of the library in the palace of the Banu Marwan, that was the royal family, that there were 44 catalog, catalogs or fairest of books. Each catalog comprised of 20 pages and they contain only the titles of books and nothing else. So you have like, if you multiply 44 by 20, we're talking about 880 pages that contained only the book titles and nothing else. And I don't know what was the dimension of those pages in those catalogs. al hakam built a market as well, Sook, Sookul Kutub, to buy and sell books for those who love knowledge. Now, I also read somewhere that uh, before the Mongol invasion of Baghdad, Baghdad was known as like one of the cities of books. And there used to be Aswakul Kutub, the book markets, where people will go and buy and sell books. In those days, the books were written by hands. So if people wanted a book, they will go to a katib and he will transcribe it and give it back, uh, give it to the customer in a few days. And some books were like the best sellers on the New York Times list. So the, the kutab, the writers, would actually have several copies, several manuscripts of those books ready to sell. Even the maidens, the girls in palaces were great poets and had good grasp in the Arabic literature. Most of this literature has been lost to us. And Cordoba became the most important intellectual center of Western Europe. The Western literature at that time was only beginning <clears throat> to wake up. There was a time when Greeks and Romans composed outstanding literature, which is still available, and we Muslims don't read it. But there is a lot of wisdom in that as well. I'm not proselytizing, but just uh, I love literature, reading literature, wherever it is from. But Europe was in dark ages, while in Islam and in the Islamic land, including Cordoba, which was in Europe, a lot of literary activity was already going on. It was perhaps at its peak at that time, while Western Europe was just beginning to wake up at the time of what's known as the Renaissance or the rebirth. So now <clears throat> we'll talk about the start of Ibn Hazm's formal studies in the intellectual milieu of that time. A brilliant guy, a very thoughtful guy, an independent thinker, he must have learned many of those sciences, but then he was about 26 years old when he started a dedicated study and concentrated on the intellectual task. I told you last time, a couple of weeks ago, that what could have stimulated Ibn Hazm to embark upon a study of Islamic fiqh, that way he had gone to the masjid before Asr prayers for a funeral prayer, and he was asked to offer two rakat of tahiyyatul masjid. And when he came back after the burial, after Asr prayer, before Maghrib, he stood up to pray Tahiyatul Masjid and people say you cannot pray it at that time. So that actually did affect him. It influenced him that how little he knew about Islamic fit. So as was the custom in those days, and as I mentioned earlier, that most of the work at that time was being done in the Maliki, on the Maliki fit. So he also studied Maliki Madhab under the expert Ibn Dahun, and he learned his usul and details for some time, he also took interest in the Shafi'i Madhab and studied the books until finally he followed the path of the Zahiri Madhab. Now here, if you look at it, that Imam Ash-Shafi'i studied under Imam Malik. So he was a Maliki at one point. Then he went to Baghdad, where he studied under the Hanafi scholars. So he became partly Hanafi, partly Maliki. Then he returned to Mecca, where he struggled with the Maliki fiqh on one hand and the Hanafi fiqh on the other. And eventually he carved out his own road, which subsequently became Shafi'i Madhab. And there is Madhab al-Qadim and Madhab al-Jadid that we have studied when we were studying Imam Shafi'i's life and works. So here you have another outstanding towering figure of Islamic fiqh, Ibn Hazm, who was studied the Maliki fiqh because that was the norm in those days. But then he started to take interest in Shafi'i Madhab. And I have not been able to find out what could have turned him away from Maliki Madhab and toward the Shafi'i Madhab. But then finally, he gave up Shafi'i Madhab as well. 
and he followed the path of Zari Madhab and he became its leading exponent until today. Actually, till today, because there is nobody else in the world who has done so much for the Zari Madhab. As happened in the rest of the Islamic world, there were really religious gatherings and debates, like we call them Munazirat. And we know that Imam Ashafi engaged in Munazirat, especially with his own teacher, Imam Hassan Ashaybani, Rahmahullah, the Hanafi. So in Valencia, one of the areas of Spain, there used to be a lot of religious gatherings and debates where the ulama will get together and they will discuss and debate different issues uh, from different madhaib, giving their own evidence. So ad dhabi who has written some famous books in Islam about the scholars, one of them is Tazkiratul Huffaz. He reports an account from a contemporary of Ibn Hazm. So the, that contemporary mentioned that we were in the city of Valencia studying Maliki Madhab. And Abu Muhammad, which is the kunya of Ibn Hazm, Rahmahullah, listened to the discussion and he was amazed at what he heard. He asked a question to those in the gathering to which they merely replied, which means they didn't re reply much. Ibn Hazm was not convinced with the answer. He just did not want a straightforward answer. He wanted some detail. So he argued back. And then someone in the audience said, this knowledge is beyond your level. Right? It happens to us that you ask a question from scholars and they will kind of run you down by saying, oh, you won't understand it. It's, it's, it's higher knowledge. It's only for the ulama. And Ibn Hazm would not accept it. He was disturbed by this and he started studying fiqh in detail himself. A few months later, Ibn Hazm reached the same place and held a debate with the same people and he said, I follow the haqq, which is the truth, and I do ijtihad. I do not restrict myself to any madhab. Now, there is some real depth in this statement. What he's saying is that the scholars whom he asked this question knew only the Maliki Madhab. They didn't know the opinion of other Madahib, the evidence of other Madahib, because they had grown in the Maliki Madhab. They probably knew only the evidence from Maliki Madhab, and they considered it to be the Haqq. The truth, the absolute truth. Our opinion, our belief that we hold becomes the absolute truth for us. So if I'm a Hanafi, for me it is the truth that we don't say Amin loudly. If you're a non-Hanafi, if you're a Shafi, the truth is to say Amin loudly. But we need to look at the evidence. Again, not everybody is capable of performing the ijtihad. And it is not for everybody to restrict, to not to restrict to any particular madhab unless that person has the knowledge, he has the time to study all the madhab, to look at all the evidence and then follow what he thinks is the strongest opinion. And again, it is not for everybody, but obviously Ibn Hazm was exceptional and he was not satisfied with the answer that he received and he was definitely disturbed by the comment that this knowledge is beyond your level. So now he goes to them and he tells them, I follow the haqq. Now this truth was his truth. And again, I would say that not every truth is absolute. Most of the things that we consider to be truth are actually relative. We consider them to be truth. Another one may have a different kind of truth. So, and then he said, La qal illa ma qal Allah. There is no statement except the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means if something is in the Quran, then we can't prefer any other opinion over the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wala nattabiyu illa rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we don't follow anybody except the Prophet And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not ordered to follow anyone else other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the book and what the Prophet has mentioned. The Quran talks about Atiullah wa Atiur Rasul and it also talks about in kuntum tuhibbun Allah fattabi'uni yuhubibkum Allah wa yaqfil lakum dunubakum. That if you really claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then follow me. That is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you. So in Islam, the primary evidence comes from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said. That is the Quran. And what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, which most scholars will say will be an explanation of the Quran since the Sunnah cannot overrule the Quran. And again, this is a debatable point. I will not go into that, but this is the majority opinion. 
So Ibn Hazm and books of Hadith. So this is where I want to spend some time, and there's a the large number of books are mentioned in this slide, and I take the opportunity of introducing some of the books of Hadith. The most people don't go beyond Bukhari and Muslim. Many of this, in fact, majority may even not even know the names of the Sahai Sitta or the six authentic books of Hadith, and those who know six may not even know that there are other books of Hadith. Many of them were written even before Bukhari and Muslim, and many of them were written after Bukhari and Muslim. So, not all the Hadiths are present in Bukhari and Muslim, and it is not true that the only authentic Hadiths are to be found in Bukhari and Muslim, and other books do not contain Sahih Hadiths. So here we look at how Ibn Hazm looked at these collections, and it also tells me that he had read a lot. He wrote about 80,000 pages and he just didn't write out of personal opinion. He had consulted a lot of scholars. He had learned from a lot of scholars. He consulted uh, from a lot of books and he must have read all the books of Hadith that he's mentioning, which also mean that these books were present in Spain in the libraries of the Spain to which Ibn Hazm had access. So he said that <coughs> people say that Ajalul Musannifat al mawatta the most honorable of books, is al mawatta And we have seen that Imam Ash-Shafi <coughs> had mentioned that Ashaul Kutub Bada Kitab Allah al mawatta that al mawatta is the most authentic book after the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this statement was subsequently modified that Ashaul Kutub Bada Kitab Allah Sahih al-Bukhari, that the most authentic book after the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Bukhari. Now, <coughs> Ibn Hazm challenged this point that the most honorable book is al mawatta which to me seems like was the most widely held opinion in Spain because Maliki Madhab was the official Madhab and most of the work in fact was being done on al mawatta So he said that Bal all al kutub tazim as sahihan He said no. He negates this statement. He said the most uh, the, uh, the, number, the number two books you can say the higher books in, in, uh, in the respect of Tazim, respect are a Sahihan, which means Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. But then he mentioned the names of these books that most people even don't even know about. Sahih Sayyid bin Sakan, I don't even know if this book is available. Wal Muntaqale Ibn al Jarud. Now, Ibn al Jarud was actually the grandfather of Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, who compiled this book, Al Muntaqa. And from Al Muntaqa, Imam Ash-Shawkani took a selection which is known as uh, Nelul Otar. And there is Al-Muntaqa Al-Qasim bin Isbaq. I don't even know if this book is available. And then he gives his own categorization, his own classification. So the number one category, the books in the, in the first category are Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Sahih, uh, Sahih of Sayyid bin Sakan. Muntaka ibn Jarud and Muntaka Qasim bin Isbaq. The second category, according to Ibn Hazm, is the Sunan Abu Dawud, Sunan Nasai, and Musannaf Qasim bin Isbaq. So Qasim bin Isbaq may have compiled two books. One is Al Muntaka, the other is Musannaf. So of the Sahih Sitta, the six authentic books, Imam Bukhari, Sahih, and Sahih of Imam Muslim are in the first category. And then Sahih da uh, Sunan Abu Dawud and Sunan al Nasai come next, according to Imam Ibn Hazm. Then the next category, he puts Musannaf At-Tahawi. At-Tahawi was a Shafi who later on turned into one of the pioneers of Hanafi Fiqh. Then Musnad Al-Bazzar, Musnad Ibn Abi Sheba, who was also a Hanafi, Musnad Ahmad Ibn Hanbal, Musnad Ibn Rahavia, Ishaq Ibn Rahavia was a Shafi scholar, one of the teachers of Imam Ahmad Ibn Hanbal, Musnad At-Tialisi, Musnad Al-Hasan bin Sufyan, Musnad Sanjar, Musnad Abdullah bin Muhammad al Musnad, Musnad Yaqub bin Shaiba, Musnad Ali bin al Madini, who was one of the teachers of Imam Bukhari, Musnad Ibn Abi Gharza. And he said these are the books that contain only the hadith of the Prophet. Hazihil Kutub Allati Ifradat Le Kalam Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sarfan. So these books contain nothing but the statements of the Prophet and why is he saying this? He's saying this because al mawatta contains 
ahadis of the prophet sallallahu opinions and statements of the sahaba ridwanullah alay majmain and the scholars afterwards as well in fact about 50% of the reports in al mubatta are the ahadis of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the rest are the opinions of sahaba and uh, tabeen and other scholars whereas these books contain only kalam rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so ibn hazm preferred all of these book over al mubatta and you can imagine what would have happened to him in spain we'll read about it inshallah and then he mentioned the summa ba'd al-latifiyah kalamuhu wa kalam ghayrihi and then come those book in which there are statements of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the statements or opinion of others including said the igif example musnaf musannaf abdur razzaq musannaf abi bakr ibn abi shaiba musannaf baqi bin mukhlad kitab muhammad bin nasalam maruzi kitab abi bakr bin al munzir al akbar wal asghar so there are two books the bigger one and the smaller book and then he comes to other books uh, musannaf hamad bin salama musannaf said bin mansur musannaf waqi waqi was one of the hanafi scholars and he was also one of the teachers of imam bukhari musannaf al faryabi mawatta malik bin anas so you look at it where does he place mawatta malik bin anas and the reason is that in mawatta it's not just the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that are included but imam malik also included other opinions man mawatta ibn abi zaid mawatta ibn wahab masail ahmad ibn hanbal fiqh abi ubaid wa fiqh abi thor so you can imagine how many books he must have read just on hadith alone so this is his categorization it is not my categorization i am only a student <clears throat> so how does ibn hazm progress as a jurist and i have taken this from muhammad abu zahra's book he has written an entire book on ibn hazm hayatuhu asluhu fikruhu wa fiquhu so ibn hazm his life his time his uh, fikr his thought process and his jurisprudence so he mentioned and i will just read to quote ibn hazm assert ibn hazm had certainly read shafi books of jurisprudence and he might have read shafi's ikhtilaf al malik so imam malik had written a book in which he delineated his differences with imam malik and this then subsequently became a part of kitabul um which is a criticism of malik's jurisprudence i introduced this book uh, when we discuss imam shafi so, and ibn hazm also might have known that shafi imam shafi ramaullah avoided criticizing his master or his teacher imam malik ramaullah for a long time and that shafi did not do so until he had become aware that the people of andalus were asking for the blessing from malik's head i mentioned this in detail when we discuss imam shafi uh, that imam shafi did uh, uh, istikhara for about 1 year before he came out publicly about his from uh, about his criticism of imam malik with respect he wrote his criticism to explain that although imam malik was a knowledgeable scholar he was still a human being like anyone else and that the blessing should be asked only from allah subhanahu wa taala these are the words of imam shafi the malikis based themselves too much on the rai opinion and qiyas of the earlier maliki jurist so now from after imam malik came his students and other students who were also fuqaha and they used their opinion and their analogical reasoning because i mentioned this before that masail the issues are infinite whereas the text is finite so it is inevitable that one has to use some form of opinion based upon qiyas and other uh, tools of jurisprudence so there were maliki jurist who gave their also also gave their opinions so now according to imam uh, ibn hazm they were neglecting much from the revealed sources which is quran and hadith zahiri is as i mentioned earlier when we discussed uh, imam dahud al zahiri that he didn't uh, favor the use of analogical reasoning ibn hazm must have appreciated the great importance imam shafi gave to the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so that is probably the reason why he moved away from maliki fiqh to the fiqh of imam shafi especially ibn hazm must have read ar risala of imam shafi where he gives great importance to hadith as an authority however shafi mazhab only temporarily satisfied ibn hazm and the historical accounts give the impression that he followed shafi mazhab for a short time and then proceeded to adopt the methodology methodology of zahiris it's not easy to move from following one madhab to another madhab 
we are not talking about common people. We are talking about a brilliant person, Ibn Hazm, a scholar of very high standard. And he's reading with a very open mind and following one for a while, then finding that there were some problems and then he starts to follow another madhab and then he changes that as well. So he just didn't do it uh, without thinking. He must have thought a lot before doing this thing. Historians have written that Ibn Hazm studied Zahir Fiqh, its precepts and methods under his teacher, Abul Khayar Masood bin Sulaiman. Abul Khayar was the faqih of the Zahiri Fiqh and a pious individual. So he was in Spain at that time. So although the Maliki mother was the official mother, there were people who were following other schools of jurisprudence as well. And Ibn Hazm mentions his teacher in some of his works, quote, between the years 418 to 420, we find in this is uh, uh, some other book, sorry, who quotes that between the years of 418 to 420, we find him, that is Ibn Hazm, teaching the Zahiri method with his masters, Abu al Khair of Santarim in the great mosque of Cordoba. The Malikis and common people, now comes the criticism of Imam Ibn Hazm. The Malikis and common people, however, denounced the two Zahiris and the senior magistrate of the city, the Qazi, after receiving the approval of the last Umayyad Caliph Hisham III al mutad al muqtad banned them from teaching. So now this can also happen that when one, one madhab has the support of the government, it can actually impose itself not only on common people, but also on other scholars who are not following that particular madhab and ban them from teaching. This happens till today as well in some countries. Now, there is a scholar who has written a book uh, on Ibn Hazm, and one of the chapters is called His Conversion to Zahirism. That how did Ibn Hazm move from Maliki madhab to Shafi madhab and then to the Zahiri madhab? So he says that although Ibn Hazm was taken at first by the Shafi, by the Shafi critical approach and defended the school vigorously against Maliki jurists who charged him with heresy, he continued his inquiry into the law, studying Quranic commentaries and various codices of tradition with a view to their accuracy and authenticity. So he read the Tafasir and he read the books of Fat, he read the books of Hadith, but he paid particular attention to their accuracy and authenticity. With this broadened base of knowledge, and you can see, you can judge it from the names of the books over there that I've already mentioned a couple of slides ago. So with this, with this broadened base of knowledge, he was able to comprehend the basic issues at hand, acquiring thereby an impersonal and critical approach to them. So impersonal and critical approach. I found that if you debate with a scholar following a particular mother, and if you disagree, he will he will become very personal. In fact, I've seen like almost fist fight on television when the scholars are debating such issues with each other in Pakistan. But you know, it's very difficult to be absolutely objective and have an impersonal and critical approach when it comes to the study of religion. So this approach led him to abandon Shafiism on the same grounds as Malikism, that is human authority. So you can say that the followers of Imam Malik, centuries later, they behaved as if they were speaking in God's name. And similarly, those who came after Shaf, Imam Shafi much later did not have the same openness of mind that Imam Malik and Imam Shafi had, but they behaved as if they were speaking in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that what they were saying was authoritarian, authentic, and the absolute truth. So Ibn Hazm was obviously disturbed that human authority was given equal credence to divine authority and this was not acceptable to Imam Ibn Hazm. Consequently, the Shafi'ah's use of analogical reasoning for arriving at legal decisions became as abhorrent to him as the Malikids use of taqlid or imitation. So now we have two extremes. On the one hand, the taqlid of the predecessors. On the other is the use of analogical reasoning. And Ibn Hazm 
didn't like either. He didn't want to be on extremes. He wanted to find out his own middle path. So now Ibn Hazm obviously faced a very he heavy opposition from Maliki scholars of his time and the rulers. And with, as we have seen, when us being Imam Ashafi and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, that they were also opposed, they faced heavy opposition from the rulers. And Imam Ashafi had to face the wrath of the Malikis as well. So Ibn Hazm was a persona non grata, means an undesirable person in Spain for his teachings and harsh criticism on his opponents to the point that he was forcibly removed from the great mosque of Cordoba for his Zahiri teachings, which was against principles of predominant Maliki Madhab. Now, Ibn Hash, uh, Hazm did not have a sweet tongue. He, When he disagreed with people on certain issues, he expressed his disagreement very forcibly. And which was which was not likely to go down well and favorably with the Maliki because they felt threatened. Historians have written that the Maliki jurist of that time instigated the rulers to act against Ibn Hazm. But the reality is that the rulers were also looking for an opportunity to persecute Ibn Hazm, as he was their political opponent and great supporter of Umayyas. We saw that a couple of weeks ago that the power tended to shift between the Umayyads to the non-Umayyads and back and forth. When the Umayyads came into power, even for a brief period of time, Ibn Hazm will be in their good books and he will find himself to be a minister. And then when the other group came, he will be put in jail. So the two group enemies consisting of the Maliki jurist and the rulers joined together to punish and persecute Ibn Hazm. I will end today's talk by reciting to, to you selection from a very famous poem of Pasida by Ibn Hazm in his English translation. Inshallah, next week we'll talk about several juristic issues related to Ibn Hazm's methodology, how he actually applied his knowledge to arriving at fit. So part of this very famous poem, which is a Qasida of Ibn Hazm, he said, Ana shamsu fi jabbil ulumi munira. ولكن عيبي أن مت أن متل إلى الغرب ولو أنني من جانب الشرق تعلي لجد على ما دع من ذكري النحق ولي نحو أكناف العراق سبابا ولا غروا أن يستوهش الكلف السب بين ينزل الرحم بين ينزل الرحمن رحل بينهم فهي نيز يبدو التأسف والكرب. A longer translation. I am the sun which shines in this heavens of science. So the heavens of science is Ulumil Munira. Although my only fault was to be born in the West, he was not born in Baghdad. For if the light of my science appeared in the East, surely all would then boast as if it were their own. Everyone would not want to claim Ibn Hazm. Of the prestige which none occurs me here. So nobody in his own hometown was there to appreciate him or to give him enough respect. My loving soul reaches to Iraq. For it is no wonder the passionate lover desires with dejected longing to join his beloved. If in God's merciful commands it were written that I should be exiled forever to the land of Iraq, then my countrymen would begin to mourn and weep for me. How many think that I am contemptible while they have me near? Yet, if they were to lose me, would gladly seek my doctrine in the book of Orient, the East. Truth to tell, a country which will not even let me live, he's lamenting his persecution in his own hometown, the place where he was born, the place he loved to stay there, to learn and to teach, but he was prohibited from expressing his ideas. Truth to tell, he wants to tell a truth, a country which will not even let me live, is too small for me. In Nardallah in Asia, Allah's land is wide. Far though its horizons of westlands and gardens may extend, that even if the country of Spain has a long horizon, it has a lot of wastelands, it has a lot of gardens, it extends far and wide, and yet it is too small for me because my intellect cannot flourish here. 
and he launched that he will be exiled to the land of Iraq and only then he will be truly appreciated and then his own countrymen in Spain would begin to mourn and weep for him and they would gladly seek his doctrine in the books of Orient. That was not going to happen. But he continued his work and inshallah next week we will look at it in more detail. Aqooli kawale haza wa astaghfirullah wa lakum wa la zikrullahi akbar. Salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.